I was with a group of boys the other day, teenage boys, and I was just listening to about a dozen of them, and I was listening to them, and they were talking about how people have told them they can, can't can say this or they can't say that, and they were like, we don't believe in that. We're gonna say whatever we wanna say. We grew up in a time where our parents told us, you can do anything, you can be anything, anything in your wildest imagination can be a possibility because you're an American. But then at the exact same time, those people in that age group and demographic in the political world are turning around and pointing the finger at us saying, we're too young, we're too inexperienced, we're too stupid and uneducated, we're too obsessed with technology, we need to sit down and wait our turn. Today, sticking it to the man is quite literally embracing conservative values. It's saying that men are men and women are women. It's desiring marriage. It's rejecting these four-year leftist arts degrees that we've been told we need for success. It's believing in God instead of government because we're building for the future. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Chad Prather Show. Good to be with you guys. There's so many things going on in this world. Um, and I want to tell you the fun stuff that's going on in this world is, of course, my live shows. And I want you to come to one of them. Uh, we're bouncing all over the country and having a good time doing it. So Joliet, Illinois, uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, New Lebanon, Indiana. Uh, we're going to be in Waco, Texas. We're going to be in Granbury, Texas. Tons of stuff coming up. And um, I'm also going to be in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, I'll tell you more about that later on. Uh, just a little hint, just to tease you guys a little bit. But we'll talk about it. Um, you know, there's so many things whenever I consider um, whenever I consider the country and I think we're doomed because I just don't think things can get any crazier or the insanity, insanity can get any weirder. And I'm thinking, well, this generation that's coming along is probably not going to be much help because, you know, you know, every older generation looks at the younger generations and thinks that there's no hope for any, any, you know, any future here in America. But I don't know. The more I look at that and try to think critically, I think I don't, I don't know that that's true. And so uh, one of my favorite follows on social media is, uh, is, a, is a young lady by the name of Isabel Brown. A lot of you probably do follow her and catch her um, catch her reaction videos and also her commentary and her hot takes on the things that are going on. And, and she's one of those younger people from that dreaded Generation Z. And she joins me today, Isabel Brown. How are you? Chad, thank you so much for having me. I've been such a longtime listener of all of your content and the show and just so excited to be joining you for a great conversation. Couldn't have teed it up better myself that Gen Z is this dreaded, horrible end of the alphabet situation because we're here to disprove those narratives today. Yeah, you I, and I'll tell you, you do a good job. You've got a brand new book that just came out. It's called The End of the Alphabet, and it's how Gen Z can save America. Um, I, I will, let's, let's, let's shelve that for a second, okay? Let, let, Cause I will come back to the book, but, but I want folks to get to know you a little bit because, uh, I've been following you for a long time and, and, you know, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or whatever, your videos are phenomenal. I watch them and your re reaction videos are classic because you have that, you have the good shocked face, right? Like I try to do reaction videos to crazy stuff. And I just look like a, the old man screaming, get off my lawn. You know, <laughs> you have the great reactions to the crazy stuff that's going on there. How, how did you get into doing all that you're doing as a commentator, as, as just, and, 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 and to that, do you see yourself as being more political or more mm. cultural with, with your commentary? What are your thoughts? You know, if you had asked me a couple of years ago if we'd even be having this conversation right now, I would have thought you were absolutely insane. I never saw myself working as a content creator or the dreaded word influencer, which I yeah. personally hate, uh, or even a political commentator or an author in any sense. I was actually pre-med in college. I have loved science ever since I was a little girl. And mainly, I've been obsessed with science because it's always been about the pursuit of objective truth, where we could do all this research, we could ask all the biggest questions about the history of the universe and how everything works from planets and solar systems down to the cells in our bodies, and there would be a correct answer at the end of all of that. <laughs> Uh, no matter what our hypothesis looked like. And so I pursued my degree in college at Colorado State University in biomedical sciences and later ended up going on to get my essentially healthcare uh, policy master's, longer name of the program at Georgetown in graduate school. 
Uh, never thought I would be doing something like this. Obviously, my life has gone in a completely different direction. But sitting in my classes at CSU, a very agriculturally based conservative uh, university in my home state of Colorado, sitting in organic chemistry and anatomy and physiology, I was realizing that science, at least in academia, but I think COVID let us know all science, really isn't about the pursuit of objective truth anymore. It's about professors pushing a political agenda. We spent a lot of time talking about the southern border or this evil orange guy that a bunch of white <laughs> supremac supremacist middle-aged people in middle America had voted into office. And I became really frustrated knowing that I felt like the only person on my sea of 33,000 students college campus that had the values that I did. So I started hosting events on my college campus. I brought some speakers. Uh, Candace Owens gave her first ever speech on a college campus to my chapter of Turning Point USA when I was a student. We brought people like Dennis Prager to come talk about objective truth and free speech and why that matters and started a bit of a cultural revolution on my college campus that I fell in love with uh, and wanted to take with me after graduation. If you know anything about Gen Z, we conduct our entire existence through these magical devices and decided <laughs> yeah. I wanted to keep that conversation going in any way that I could as a content creator. So totally stumbled into this world, have been so fortunate to work with so many different organizations over the last five years or so since starting this journey, Turning Point USA, uh, PragerU, Students for Life, done some work with The Daily Wire. And today I'm an independent content creator and I host a live stream, I write books, I give a lot of speeches. But I like to say that the scientist in me still gets to do what she loves every day because my job really is to just get up and tell people the truth, whether that's writing a whole book or a three hour live stream or a 15 second video on TikTok. It's amazing the world we live in. You know, I was in radio and television and and I too had pursued a number of other things career wise as, as a younger guy. And if you'd have told me a long time ago that I was just going to make a living running my mouth these days <laughs> and, and that I was going to trade doing a show on a cable network on television for, you know, a so social media career. Everywhere I go, when people introduce me as an internet influencer or an internet sensation, God forbid, uh, I always <laughs> that say that could be good or bad depending uh, on the situation. It, it I really is. I mean, it sounds like I've got an OnlyFans or something, but I, but I'm like, uh, I just tell people, I said that's just a 21st century way of saying I'm unemployed, but I'm popular, right? Exactly. Well because said. Most well said. Most people say, most people say, oh, I, I was talking to somebody the other day in the airport. This couple from. Um, San Diego. And they said, so what do you do? And, and you know, you're like, Oh, I said, well, I have a podcast. And they're like, and you get, you get, you get paid for like, you are you, <laughs> do you need a donation? Uh, uh, or if I tell people that I do comedy for a living and they're like, well, you're like, a, that's full time, you know, that's not just a hobby. Uh, it, it is so funny how there's a lot of the older generation, even older than me, mm -hmm. who, who look at my generation, Gen X, and they go, that doesn't make any sense to us. And now my generation, Gen X, looks at millennials and, and even Gen Z, which you're a part of, and my kids are a part of, and I'm like, N you guys are speaking a foreign language. Like, I don't understand why you do what you do or how you think the way you think. You know, I see my own daughters on their TikTok channels and they're incredible creators, way beyond anything that I would come up with. And it blows my mind that these devices that we use are, are so capable of transmitting, mm -hmm. you know, information and misinformation. Hey guys, I want to remind you that maybe things are not as dismal as they seem. I mean, you, you still have time to prepare and there's a point to preparing. Like you want to make sure that your family's taken care of. You want to make sure that your people are protected, that in the chance that something bad goes down, you are taken care of. Protect yourself, protect your people. You deserve it. You need to rely on yourself. And the folks out there that will help you do that is My Patriot Supply. They got a cool new deal going right now at MyPatriotSupply.com. They've helped millions of Americans prepare for uncertain futures. I know that I am a customer, I am a partner with them, and I have used their products. Now, what you need to do is you need to go out there and start with their four-week emergency food kit by Ready Hour. It's 16 food and drink varieties, so you're not going to have food boredom. There's a lot of cool stuff in there, over 2,000 calories a day, so you're not going to go hungry either. So they're sealed inside the ultra-durable packaging, and the meals last up to 25 years in storage, so you can always know that you're prepared. I want you to go to my 
special website, preparewithchad.com, and get your food kits. Get them because your family deserves it. Preparewithchad.com. Each uh, four-week food kit from Ready Hour right now is $60 off. Also, you're going to get the free shipping like usual. So protect yourself. Protect your people. Um, if you're not ready, well, it ain't Ready Hour. Use Ready Hour. Go to preparewithchad.com. That's preparewithchad.com. You know, you talk about going to Colorado State, then going to Georgetown, and there's a big battle out there. There's a big debate these days about whether the this younger generation should go to college or should they just skip it? Uh, is it is it good time investment? Is it good financial investment? You know, you're you're going to go into probably into some financial debt with all of that. What do you think about that? Is college still a good decision? This might be the most frequent question I am asked, both by really? people who have children who are teenagers and by teenagers themselves, because yeah. I'm glad this has turned into such a cultural debate, but we really can't define the value of a college education the same way that we used to be able to five or 10 years ago. I remember being on my campus and being really frustrated about some of the mandatory electives that I had to take in order to get my degree. I was a science student. I was taking classes like physics and microbiology and human gross anatomy, working with cadavers every day. And that made total sense to me, the value of that going to medical school eventually. But I didn't understand why I had to take a mandatory creative writing class from a graduate school t TA who had it out for me because I was known as that conservative girl on campus. And she gave me an F on my paper about healthcare policy after wow. I had worked at the White House the semester before, by the way, which was quite funny, uh, saying that I followed the directions too closely and I plagiarized the rubric. So therefore, I cheated and got an F on the assignment and had to fight oh, wow. with the, the dean of that college and everything because of it. I hear stories like this all the time, down to the plot of popular movies like God's Not Dead. I had a friend on my campus literally be sat down in her philosophy course freshman year, big giant lecture hall, and on day one was told God does not exist. If you disagree, get out of this class, and we're going to be working on a paper the whole semester to prove that to be the case, her family were Coptic Christians that had escaped Egypt, fleeing religious persecution, and that was the biggest part of her identity. She never thought in Fort Collins, Colorado, at a public university, she would be facing that type of religious persecution, too. So I think there's a lot to be said about particularly the liberal arts completely degrading any semblance of value on a college campus today. Because truthfully, they're not the liberal arts, they're the leftist arts today. And they're not interested mm. in teaching you how to think. They're interested in having you all look different, but think exactly the same. But as someone who loved STEM, I loved my STEM classes, and I still would go back and make the same decision today. It's really telling to me that the vast majority of college degrees being pursued now are in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Our world is demanding a whole lot more of that, and we need people adequately equipped to tackle the issues of STEM culturally and in the workforce that I think academia is still playing a little bit of catch up for. So the short answer is it depends. It depends on what degree you're particularly interested yeah. in, but do I think it's worth spending $250,000 to get your diploma in, I don't know, <laughs> underwater lesbian dance theory? No, probably not. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's a great answer. I, and I love what you just said about it's not liberal arts, it's leftist arts. Now, you know, one of the things that I told my kids when they and, and all of them have either gone to college or are in college and and that's four kids. So it's not like I have an army of kids, but I but, you know, two or two have gone to college and graduated. Two are in college now. And I said, here's the thing, guys, we're not going to fund bad ideology. Right. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go in there and, and pay for some some guy that's tenured in that's lived in an academic bubble for 15 years and done nothing but push papers around a desk who's never tested his weird theories in the real world to brainwash you. Right. Yeah. And then you come out with, you know, I've spent 18 years of investing my faith and my life and my knowledge. And so some of the wisdom, you know, into you, and the blood, sweat and tears and the sacrifices we've made to send you off to let some pinhead with glasses tell you what you should believe, right? So I agree with you in that regard. I mean, it's why are you going? If you know the why, mm -hmm. then I think that you've got the answer on that because because it could get, it, 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 I mean, it's public education aside, from, you know, from elementary school up through high school is bad enough, but then you're going to go off and pay somebody, you know, the amount of money you could build a house for to 
totally rob your brain of any knowledge and you know understanding is insane to me. You obviously survived it. I mean, you you came out pretty dadgum well, uh, and and you you look around, and you've been involved with a lot of stuff like Turning Point, as you mentioned, Prager U. Um, and isn't it amazing how those organizations catch so much flack from from the left? I mean, they're, they're they are constantly attacked. I mean, I have trolls on social media who use. Charlie Kirk's picture as an avatar, right? Like they're like they're using him as their face, their profile picture to troll me. And I'm like, you know, a guy like Charlie, he did something. He's doing something right. A guy mm-hmm. like Dennis Prager, they're doing something right to catch that much heat. What, how do you, how important do you think influences like those organizations make on this younger generation now? Oh my gosh. I mean, it has been invaluable. It's it's crazy to me knowing what I know now, thinking to myself as a 2017 year old or 2017, 19 year old college kid scrolling through Facebook and getting an ad for something called the Young Women's Leadership Summit for this organization yeah. I'd never heard of called Turning Point USA. At the time, I felt like I was the only person who believed in any of the values that I had grown up with on my college campus. And so on a whim, decided to attend this conference and totally fell in love with what they were doing. My story is not unique at all. Countless other college students, high school students, even younger now are engaging with these ideas because of groups like TPUSA and not just TPUSA in isolation either, but look at what's happening in the pro-life movement with Students Mm. for Life of America, uh, with live action on social media. PragerU has obviously totally changed the game with a lot of these five-minute videos that might be incorporated into elementary and middle school curriculum now. So cool to know that that's becoming a mainstream ideology. At the time when I first got involved, these were brand new ideas, but Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens and Dennis Prager are household names today, not just for people who are fundraising for these organizations, but for people my age who have binged every single video available to these people, and I think has really given rise to a whole generation that values this concept of being on offense and becoming a creator and a voice themselves, because it doesn't matter if you're an 18-year-old kid starting something out of their garage, or you're sitting in your dorm room or in the passenger seat of your car. If you have a camera, you have the capacity to change the world by just selling ideas and challenging the narrative and encouraging new perspectives. And now we've seen a whole generation embrace that call to action, your children included. Yeah. I said to someone long ago, I said, because people said, why did you decide to, for lack of better terms, I just started putting my camera phone on the dashboard of my truck and and started talking to the thing, you know, years ago. And I had no idea it was going to blow up the way it did. I said, you know, I came out of radio and television and and social media sort of gave you the opportunity to own your own television network. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put anything you want out there. This was before the the podcast boom really blew up. And I was like, you can control the content you're putting out there. You might as well use your platform, you know, to, to speak what you believe and use your convictions and your voice. And you have guys like, you know, I, I consider Candace and, and Charlie and all those folks, you know, they're friends. And, and, you know, Charlie, Charlie's such a humble guy. It, it's so funny because it, it, I remember we had done several events together. He'd been on my show a couple of times and uh, I had sp- spoken at the big, you know, SAS in December one year. And and I ran into Charlie at another conference we were speaking at. And he still introduced himself to me. Like, he walked up and he's like, hey, you remember me? I'm Charlie Kirk. I'm like, dude, I think I got that nailed down. You know, I think I, I know. Uh, but it's like, I, but that spoke to me. I was like, you know, here's a guy who's not, you know, so puffed up. Or he really is kind of. He really is serving the next generation in a big way. And so many of them have used their platforms in a way. So I encourage people. I'm like, you know what? You may not have the same platform as a Charlie Kirk or Isabel Brown or Candace Owens, but you still have a platform. And if you're reaching, you know, one or two people, that's still, we know now, I mean, that's, that's a major deal in this Mm -hmm. day and age. You You know, I always like to tell people not to interrupt you, but I get this question a lot from high schoolers in particular thinking, I want to do something like this. I might not want to go to college. Mm -hmm. How can I be a creator myself? Or even while I'm in school, how can I start doing this? I don't have 100,000 followers. I don't have a blue check mark. I can't go on the news. (laughs) And I always like to remind people your sphere of influence, because they're people who actually know you, Mm -hmm. is often far more valuable than someone with 5 million followers on Instagram or who goes on national television, because you sit next to them at the dinner table. You sit next to them in class. You live in the same dorm room as them. You go to church with them. 
on Sunday morning when you use your sphere of influence and your platform to talk about something that's impacting your community or just to tell the truth, you have no idea the impact that that's able to have on the people in your own life because courage is contagious and they might start doing the same thing. You, um, you, 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 you made me think of something right there. When, when you think about yourself, like when, when you look in the mirror and you consider what you do. I mean, when you grew up, have you always been an outspoken, outgoing, extroverted person? Are you a little more shy? Are you a little more introverted? How do you describe yourself? You know, when in high school, they make you start taking those personality tests, like the right. ENFP tests. And I will never forget taking my first one. And I think it was the 16 personalities test, still my favorite one. 99% extroverted. So it's not a surprise that I have always been this way. Uh, my teachers in preschool and kindergarten would say I was very headstrong and a natural leader, which is kind of a nice way of saying that she's really bossy, but I'm the oldest child. Uh, I have two younger sisters. My parents are both Catholic attorneys. So we spent a lot of time talking about religion and politics around the family dinner table. Uh, and I really attribute my parents to a phenomenal parenting leadership style that worked so well in our house. We're all very different kids. One's in medical school. One is a junior at Texas Christian University. Uh, but we always had this concept in our family that there was no such thing as a kid's table. And mm. we were always expected to participate in adult level conversations to know what was going on in the world. Our mom would sit us down and make us watch the State of the Union every year, which was terrible when we were kids. But by the time <laughs> you grew up, it was helpful to understand what this meant for the grand scheme of American culture. Uh, we all participated in speech and debate because mom and dad made us and it was horrible at first, but then we realized it was actually really fun pretending like you were a member of the US Congress or having to come up with an extemporaneous speech on the fly about, I don't know, abolishing the penny or Cambodian rice production's impact on global <laughs> GDP. We were very nerdy kids, uh, but I loved that. And I, I always loved telling parents of young children that that was the biggest thing I remember from my childhood was that there was no such thing as a kid's table and you had to stick it with the adults and you were expected to participate just as much. And it is so rewarding now. Like, you know, there's studies now that, that where they've looked back at the founding fathers, you know, people like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and how much time they spent in the presence of adults. You know, they weren't, they weren't at the kids' table. They, they spent time with adults who were debating issues and discussing things, and, and that's why they became the men that they became, right? And I've always said you got to keep – the next generation in a closer proximity because there's there's so much wisdom to be given. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in the woods. I grew up in the country, right? <laughs> we had one of those old, um, uh, we actually had encyclopedias. I mean, we had the volumes, like a 30 volume encyclopedia. And I remember when I was a kid, I just started reading the encyclopedia. And I was like, so I was kind of nerdy that way too. And just, I was just thirsty for knowledge, right? And mm -hmm. I just wanted to expose myself to all this stuff. And so like you said, it, it sounds boring, but man, it sure is rewarding when you become an adult. And you, then it sounds kind of cool when you know things, like <laughs> you just know stuff. Um, it and, pays and off with big dividends for sure. It, it really does. And you just, just kind of know things, which is cool. And, and then people are always asking you. And, it, and now the, the flip side of that is sometimes you have to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Like it's hard to say those words. But, you know, I, I, I appreciate the fact that um, – that there's those in in each generation, but particularly the younger generation. I think the older I get, like I've always been an extrovert. You know, I've always said that when I die, if if they stuffed me and put me in a museum, that I'd be in my natural habitat, which would be here's Chad at the cocktail party. <laughs> and the older I get, though, uh, I think I am becoming a little more introverted, and I, that may just be because people have started to wear me out with the insanity. But but I I'm like you know. Regardless, like I tell people, I see people say, tell me, they say, you know, you're naturally loud, like you, you're naturally talkative and outgoing. And I'm just a little more withdrawn. And I said, listen, sometimes I have to choose to be quiet, hmm. which is hard for me. So I'm going to I'm asking you to choose to be loud sometimes. And so I'm encouraging everybody out there to to speak up. Right. Use the platform they've been given. You've written this book and, and it's phenomenal. You know, the end of the alphabet. And, and it's got this incredible picture of you holding the big Z. <laughs> on, on the thing and um you know it's well endorsed i mean it, it's a great it's a great deal what do you, i mean it's another it's another book right i always tell people say yeah chad you need to write another book and i'm like do we need another book and i'm like 
as long as there's another perspective. And you bring such a fresh perspective to this. And I don't think anybody can speak to this issue as well as you do. How did how did you approach this? What motivated you? And, and kind of like, what was the perspective going into writing this book? Hmm. You said something there that I love. You said you're encouraging people to get loud and to choose to use their platform for, for good. Leadership yeah. to bring what's good and true and beautiful back to society. I've noticed a vacuum of voices for a long time mm. in the conservative movement. You asked me earlier if I talk more about politics or culture, uh, and I, I really started in the political realm. I am nothing if not a political nerd. I worked for the U.S. Senate and the White House in college. I can sit here and talk about what bill Congress is currently debating all day long, and it is my favorite thing to do. But I've realized for a long time that Generation Z has a completely different cultural perspective on our day-to-day -day lives than anybody who came before us because we're growing up in what I like to call the upside down, if you're a fan of Stranger Things. Uh, we're coming into adulthood in this time that looks kind of familiar to our favorite 90s sitcoms that we binge, and it sounds mm. kind of like what our parents experienced at our age, but the truth is up has become down and lies have become truth, men have become women, and just about everything in between. So we're operating on a brand new cultural playing field, and I think that has yet to manifest politically. So I took a step back about two years ago as a creator and said, I can be another talking head in the space on the Internet talking about who's running for president, what's going on in the U.S. Senate, oh, this crazy thing that somebody fundraised for or Joe Biden's latest gaffe, which the uh, State of the Union was full of them last week, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, but is that really productive? Is that really capturing people that aren't already involved in the conversation? Uh, no, it's not. And so I decided to talk more about cultural issues first and dabble some politics in there because we're operating on this totally different cultural playing field. When you look at Gen Z, there has been such an echo chamber that doesn't include who we are and the perspective that we have to offer in right of center American politics for really as long as I can remember, which is ironic because we grew up in a time where our parents told us you can do anything, you can be anything, anything in your wildest imagination can be a possibility because you're an American. But then at the exact same time, those people in that age group and demographic in the political world are turning around and pointing the finger at us saying, we're too young, we're too inexperienced, we're too stupid and uneducated, we're too obsessed with technology, we need to sit down and wait our turn. And I've been really frustrated with that because I saw this twofold problem that A, nobody's properly rallying Gen Z on the right, while the left mm. is saying, your voice matters, your vote matters, we want you to be the front and center of everything that we're fighting for because we're building for the future, but also that there was this fundamental misunderstanding from those older than us about who we are, what our values are, and what we're trying to accomplish as a generation. We've seen Gen Z written off on the right as socialist, as lazy, as entitled, as these blue-haired, scream-at-the-sky socialists who are the death of America, the end of everything that we know to be good and true and beautiful, the dreaded Gen Z, as you said, at the beginning of the podcast, which is why I named the book The End of the Alphabet, because in many ways, I think people older than us think this is the end of life as we know it, with my generation growing up and coming into adulthood. But when you look around and you think about life as we know it in 2024 America, if life as we know it is Dylan Mulvaney trying to sell me a tampon on TikTok, even though there's nowhere to put that, I'm pretty okay <laughs> with the end of life as we know it. If it's telling a 12-year-old girl she needs to castrate herself in order to feel loved and accepted in society, I'm okay with the end of life as we know it. Yeah. If it's normalizing polyamory and dating 20 people at once and killing the institution of marriage and family, I think we're all okay with the end of life as we know it. And so just like every generation that came before us, Gen Z is doing this beautiful historical pattern of rebelling against the people who came before us in the earlier decades of American history, being punk rock and countercultural could have looked like covering your body with tattoos and spiky hair and being a part of a punk rock band and sticking it to the man. But yeah. today, sticking it to the man is quite literally embracing conservative values. It's believing in God instead of government. It's saying that men are men and women are women. It's desiring marriage. It's rejecting these four-year leftist arts degrees that we've been told we need for success. And so amazingly, culturally, we are the most conservative generation America has seen since World War II. And I wrote this book not just to rally our generation and to encourage people to get louder, but to expose that truth to those older than us who've just never been exposed to that reality. 
That's that's a mouthful. It's so it's so important what you just said because I know that there's those out there who I'm 51 years old and I know there's there's people my age who would go, "Why do I want to read a book about Gen Z? Why would that be relevant to me?" Listen, Look at the attacks that are going on, right? Everything from, as you said, transitioning children, puberty blockers, hormone blockers, uh, gender, you know, genital mutilations. I mean, all of these things, that are, they, that's a discussion. That's a debate right now. That's Gen Z. We're talking about mm-hmm. that younger generation. They talk about, you know, raising the age to vote. They talk about uh, all these different legal limits, 18 versus 21. It's a huge debate right now. Um and just the sheer fact that we look at our internet screens and we shake our heads because we see something else that we think is ridiculous should tell us, hey, maybe we should understand who it is we're talking about. Like this debate is is important here. If we're gonna if we're gonna, you know, for lack of better terms, bitch about it, we might as well know who it is we're bitching about. So let's let's inform ourselves. So you you talk about them being, you talk about Gen Z being the most conservative generation since World War II. Because I think, I don't think most people my age or older would believe that. I think they look at it and they see the voices that are being amplified and they're Mm -hmm. like, God, we're doomed. We're doomed. So, I mean, what do you say to that person who thinks that way? Hey guys, the information I'm about to share with you could radically change your life. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you because right now there's a silent epidemic that is affecting over 100 million Americans. You know what it is? It is a fatty liver. You want to know why you feel sluggish, why you can't sleep, why you gain weight? Ah, You feel terrible. It's because you're throwing everything at your liver, cholesterol, toxins, um, alcohol, cigarettes, you name it. It's crazy. Your liver does so many things to help you every single day, so many different functions. You ought to be helping your liver. So I want to encourage you. If you want to look better, you want to feel better, you want to sleep better, fix your liver, okay? And you can do that with liver health formula. It's an all-natural supplement. It contains 11 clinically proven botanicals that will help recharge and protect your liver. The company's already helped more than 2 million fellow Americans with their products, and they're a proud sponsor of this show for a long time, and I'm proud to continue telling you all about liver health formula. Uh, You can try liver health formula and get five free gifts from the company. You heard me correct. That's five gifts for free. You got to go to getliverhelp.com slash Chad. Claim your free bonus gifts with your order today. It, it's helped people in my family. It's helped me. I take it daily. Getliverhelp.com. That's getliverhelp.com slash Chad. Most don't believe it, despite overwhelming data and evidence to support that claim, which I find really interesting. I think if you want to start politics, which seems counterintuitive because we believe politics is downstream from culture. So I'll come back to culture for a minute. Politically, Gen Z is already trending quite conservative. Uh, There was a new study that came out a couple of months ago that 17-year-old senior and high school boys are over 73% conservative, like overwhelmingly conservative, the most we've seen since the 1950s. The same study said girls were trending in the other direction, but I think it's just going to take a couple of years to catch up. If you look at exit polling for Gen Z voting from 2018 to 2020 to 2022, it looks like the Y equals MX plus B sample graph from your elementary school algebra class, literally in a straight line trending toward more Republican politicians, more conservative uh, ballot initiatives, and just more conservative values at large for national elections. There was a poll that just dropped last week that Joe Biden had overwhelming support from 18 to 35-year-old voters in 2020 that he is losing, and it has actually inverted to be overwhelming support for Donald Trump that Fox News covered just a couple of days ago. So the data and the polling and the statistics are out there to support that claim. But since we believe that politics is downstream from culture, it stands to reason we need to change culture first, right? That's what's eventually going to change uh, who the president is and what Congress is debating about. So let's look at culture. Gen Z, ever since COVID, had the veil pulled back on higher education, thinking, I don't really want to spend a quarter of a million dollars to get this stupid degree that everybody tells me I need to succeed But I don't actually see that out there in the job market. So 62% of us have already started our own businesses instead. And the vast majority of people our age are working multiple jobs to try to save earlier so that we can open our own business and finance our own American dream. 93% of Gen Zers currently in college say that we still want to get married, which is 
astounding in a country where we have the lowest marriage rate today in 2024 that America has ever seen since we began recording marriage rates in 1867. And we have some of the highest divorce rates. So it's not a pretty picture out there of what marriage is supposed to look like, but we know what it is intended to be. And we want more than the empty hookup culture offered to us by our dating apps, which by the way, we are overwhelmingly deleting. Go Google that for yourself. Go look it up. Uh, Gen Z is overwhelmingly trashing our dating apps because shocker, turns out these are companies vested in keeping you as a customer rather than creating an app designed to be deleted. So they're not going to help you find eternal love and happiness in all of this. Uh, We're rejecting corporatized media, which I think a lot of people particularly cable television, sees as a threat to truth and journalistic integrity. But in the era of misinformation and fake news, I would argue independent content creation is the best way to preserve journalistic integrity. Uh, Look at TikTok, for example, whatever you think of the platform based on what you've been told. TikTok has actually replaced Google for Gen Z as the number one search engine for our generation. So when we're looking for information, we're not going to type in to see an article from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or a video from Fox News. We're looking for videos from people like me or Brett Cooper over at the Daily Wire, really challenging the narrative in a more bite-sized, consumable way. Uh, And there are countless other examples of culturally what we're doing to move the needle, but it's starting to show up politically. And I think people are gonna be really surprised over the next several major election cycles that we just trend more and more conservative as culture keeps rebelling against the left in authoritarianism as well. That's a, that's amazing. And, and I know you're right because I've, I've read these studies and, and I was just talking with someone the other day, as a matter of fact, and, and you're right. I mean, I just read an article last week about how so many people are trashing the dating apps. You know, it's like, it's becoming a thing, like they're sc- scratching their heads because I said a long time ago, I said, you know, social media destroyed yeah. In so many ways, the ability to go out and, and just meet people, right? And who knows, maybe you might meet someone and fall in love with them and get married and have half a dozen kids, you know, and live together for 65 years in marriage. Uh, but but these days, people are like, oh, the concept of going out and, you know, stranger danger. I'm going to go out and meet a stranger. Are you kidding me? I don't want to do that. So you built this circle, a protective circle around yourself with social media. Nobody even goes out anymore unless their little circle of friends is all going out together kind of thing. And so I was like, I love that the fact that that people are saying, "Hey, listen, we we kind of we we're gonna we're gonna use this tool, and it is a tool, this social media tool, this screen, and we're gonna communicate with the world. We're gonna communicate with each other. We're gonna share information. We're gonna transfer ideas if we can get around the censorship, which is very real." Um, TikTok just the other day, by the way, is well. There used to be a, a rifle that was on the wall back here behind me. Mm. TikTok actually started banning my videos oh, because yeah. of the image of, and it was my grandfather's old. It's an antique, and they were still they they put the videos back up there because I was like, come on, guys. Um, <laughs> I don't know how come on, guys. You know, it translates into Mandarin Chinese, but somehow they got the message, <laughs> and they put the videos back up. But no, we'll use this tool to to translate. I, or transfer ideas, I should say. Yeah. But 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 I'm seeing an encouraging thing. Like I'm seeing um, this young generation getting better with communication. Uh, they're getting better with um, tr- just just embracing faith, uh, mm-hmm. I- embracing a pursuit of truth. I was with I was with a group of boys the other day, uh, teenage boys, and I was just listening to this group. There's about a dozen of them, and I was listening to them, and they were talking about how you know, people have told them they can, can't can say this or they can't say that. And they were like, we don't believe in that. We're going to say whatever we want to say, right? And I was mm-hmm. like, hey, I like where your head's at on that. Like, you're not going to be held back by, you know, these social mores that have told you, kind of put you in a box in a big way, because we, we have been in a large way. Uh, so I'll tell you, it's an encouraging trend, but I don't think the battle's won yet, right? I mean, it's it's always, we're always a generation away from extinction in regards Absolutely. to this. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, you look at it and you go, what comes next? I mean, it, it, we're looking at 2024. We're looking at some really weird election stuff. We've got really mm-hmm. weird people running for offices out there these days. Um, we got really weird people and a lot of really old people that are governing us in Washington, D.C. What is the hope? I mean, do, do we have hope? Where do we go from here? You know, what yeah. does that look like? Have you got any ideas and predictions? 
Boy, I'm glad you said that. I write <laughs> extensively about how most people in Congress today have actually been in public service and even in Congress in their current seat for longer than twice the time my generation has been alive. Right. And it's shocking when you start doing the research on this that people in Congress today were born before the invention of the ballpoint pen or the microwave <laughs> oven or the trampoline. And these are the same people trying to regulate higher education and the internet and social media. It's just crazy to wrap your head around. Um, just to touch on one other thing you said before I answer your question about how you're seeing young people believe in God today, perhaps the most encouraging thing I'm seeing with Gen Z is that we are trending overwhelmingly away from atheism and towards belief in God again, which mm. everyone said was impossible in American culture today, that we live in this godless, horribly lacking morals society. Uh, but in 2021, only about 25% of our generation even said that we believed in a higher power. And a survey that came out at the end of last year, 2023, said over one third of us in a span of two years now have jumped to believe in God again and to be very, very proud of it. You're seeing all these revivals on college campuses and what you're seeing on social media. So your prayers are working is the first yeah. thing that I'll say to anybody listening to this. It is not hopeless. It is not without an opportunity to rejoice because we are absolutely trending in the right direction. As for the political sphere and sort of what comes next, I think my biggest message to those on the right who might be listening to this is the left gets it. They've gotten it for a long, long time that Gen Z is not this generation to be pushed aside as stupid or illiterate or uneducated. Mm. The truth is we have literally the entire annex of history information in the world right here at the tap of one button in our mm. pocket every single day. We are actually the highly, uh, most highly educated generation in American history when you look at diplomas and how much time we've spent in classrooms. So that's a really silly direction to take if you're wanting another generation to preserve your values, to vote for your candidates, and to bring this crazy experiment called the United States of America into the next generation that is always one generation away from extinction. Yeah. People forget that in American history, even before we were a country, our country has really always depended on young voices speaking the truth and rallying against two consolidated government power to pass freedom on to those that would come after them. And I love asking this question to high schoolers and college students when I'm on campus with them because I'll almost always get the exact same answer. I will ask them, how old were the founding fathers in 1776 when the Declaration of Independence was written. And almost in unison, these kids will always answer the exact same thing. Can you guess what it is? Yeah, they had to be old men. Old white men, like geriatric, <laughs> sagging at the seams, old white men, which, by the way, isn't a bad thing to be in and of itself, but we've painted it that way right. in modern culture. But these people who were so old, they couldn't possibly understand what culture was going to be like in the future. They couldn't possibly build a system that would stand the test of time. But actually, on July 4th, 1776, James Monroe was only 18 years old. Aaron Burr was only 20. Alexander Hamilton was only 21 years old. Betsy Ross, who made the flag, was 24. James Madison, who would become president, was 25. Even Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, was only 33 years old yeah. on July 4th, 1776. And I think we forget that because when we look at our current le leadership in politics today, it is these geriatric, falling apart, can't remember their own name, old white men, but it hasn't always been that way. Yeah. So I understand the culture we've built in Washington. Heck, I've worked in it myself of the sit down and wait your turn mentality. But I think if we're serious about bringing objective reality, truth back to the next generation, let alone solid conservative traditional values, it has to start with giving those younger than you an opportunity to have a seat at the table and a voice with a megaphone to bring truth to those even younger than us. Hey guys, you know, we've spent a lot of time in recent years talking about our health, whether it was COVID or vaccines and all the stuff connected to it. So between the virus and the vaxes and whether you're jammed or not, most of us have these toxins already residing inside our bodies like a ticking time bomb just waiting to blow.
Well, I want to share with you a simple solution that will help you and your family, and that's with Warrior Essentials. Their patent-pending formula has evolved into the most powerful way to help your body heal itself. It will turn on your God-given defenses for a strong and healthy body. Warrior Essentials is not a drug, but it uses targeted nutrition to work with your body's natural defenses. It'll remove toxins, repair circulatory health, it'll restore your epigenome. Today, we're going to be able to share with you a special offer for the Prather Posse if you go to recoverwithchad.com. You got to do it now. Go to recoverwithchad.com and save up to 50% off regular prices plus free shipping. Help your body get rid of the toxic spike proteins and boost your health. Listen, can't save our country if we die suddenly. So recoverwithchad.com. That's recoverwithchad.com for up to 50% off and free shipping. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Yeah, Benjamin Franklin was the only old codger involved in the whole deal, and he was just a little over my age now. So, I mean, you know, it's it's crazy when you bring up that fact. And and I can remember, we have, but it, isn't it weird, though? Like, we've built this culture, and it was around, like, I can remember when, you know, I, I've, I've pastored churches in the ba- in the past, and and, you know, I can remember working at a church when I was, I think I was, the first church I took on was like, I was 23 years old. And everybody was like, you know, you'll get some respect maybe when you get in your 40s, right? And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, it, it, it was, and, it, and I can, I know from the church perspective, from the business perspective, we always think that these guys are going to add more whenever they get older. And it's true, yeah. wisdom and stuff does come with years and experience. But but there is we've got to start listening to the voices and 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 you read your New Testament you go over to First John you know the apostles talking about he gives a he gives a command to the to the fathers and the old men and he gives a command to the young men the sons and he's saying you both have roles to play mm-hmm. and you can't play that role without each other you've got to you know the, generationally there's something to be done there so I love this perspective that you bring and you so eloquently and consistently not defend it, but just articulate it in a powerful way. It's it's amazing to sit back. At, I'll put it this way. It's lovely to watch, okay, because it's refreshing to, to people who are concerned with the direction of this country and specifically the direction of our culture to know that someone like yourself can, can put into words what so many people are trying to convey and just don't know how to. So Kudos on that and good job with it. I, you know, what Thank something you. You, something you said earlier about we we make all these social media things and and you know I know that there's a lot of people who can spend hours just s- scrolling through the reels on TikTok or Instagram, <laughs> and you see all this mindless, mind numbing, just white noise stuff that just fills our head. You know, like I, I follow one page on Instagram. Um, it's a page dedicated to boys being boys. And it's nothing but like dudes just rolling big rocks off a cliff. Or, I you know, love that. I mean, just, like, <laughs> just boys being boys. And I'm like, but it's mindless. And, you know, I'm just like, it's fascinating because I'm like, yeah, I think that's kind of cool. I, I could sit here and watch this for a long time. But I always, it, even if I'm doing comedy or music or whatever, I want to make sure that I'm making a point, you mm-hmm. know. And that's why I said at the beginning, you're one of my favorite follows because no matter no matter what you're doing, it's entertaining, but you make a point. And uh, I, I always say, it gives people something to hang their hat on, you know. Yeah. And and you do a great job of that. You moved, you went, you moved from Colorado. You live in Miami now, right? Yes, I had a couple of stops in between there. Yeah. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and boy, I miss the mountains a whole yeah. lot. Every time I go home, I love putting my skis on or my hiking boots, and it is very good for the soul. So I will go back to the West at some point. But I spent some time living in D.C. for graduate school and afterwards uh, lived in Arizona and Phoenix for the last couple of years. And I've been in South Florida for about a year now because of my fiance's job. So it's been a great adventure. I never anticipated living in South Florida where I have problems of hurricanes and alligators instead of blizzards and avalanches. But it has been wonderful. The people are phenomenal. And gosh, is Florida just providing the best blueprint for a future America should be fighting for? I tell you, Florida's great. Um, I, I can't. I, I would never imagine living in Miami. 
Um, and that's that's next level. Everybody right said that when yeah. I said I was moving down here, and I kind of had the same reaction. You think trashy South Beach crime everywhere? Yeah. Miami is actually the only major metropolitan area in America that has overwhelmingly decreasing crime rates. Wow. There are no problems with homeless encampments anywhere. There's no trash on any of the streets. They broke up with spring break in case you missed that last week. They yeah. said, "Don't come here. We don't want you." <laughs> so the mayor is really doing some great work down here, and and people are coming from everywhere 1200 people a day are moving to the state of florida from somewhere else because yeah. they want a taste and of what florida has to offer i know whenever dave rubin was considering uh he was with me we were talking about whether he wanted to move to texas or move to florida and i said you might as well come to texas and of course he moved to miami so you know what, what he was I coming know? from la so we'll give him a bit of a break <laughs> miami does feel like what la used to be i suppose yeah it, it stuck with him so i, I it's a good move Isabel, your book is phenomenal. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna give it to get as gifts as well. Um, I I want all of my kids reading it. I want all of I want my mother to read it. I want everybody reading this book. Thank you, Chad. And uh, it's it's called the end of the alphabet. How Gen Z can save America. And listen, you did a phenomenal job. You always do. And um, I know you're tired. Doing a book tour is <laughs> uh, doing the online thing where you're doing podcasts and talking about books and stuff like that. I know it's. It's exhausting. So um, it's uh, you're still young and strong, though. So. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, I just went and saw Angel Studios' new movie, Cabrini, last night. Love it. And there was a line that I absolutely loved that I will be using. One of the sisters says, as mother says, there will be plenty of time to rest someday in heaven. Let's get back to work. And I yeah. loved that. So may everybody embrace that type of attitude. But thank you. And uh, if you listen to this episode and you're at all remotely interested in learning more about this dreaded Generation Z please consider picking up a copy. But more importantly, if you have Gen Zers in your life, this is a rallying cry for us. It's yeah. an opportunity for us to embrace that same type of leadership our founding fathers did way back then in 1776. Vivek Ramaswamy said very frequently throughout his presidential campaign that we're in a bit of a 1776 moment yeah. right now in 2024. And I couldn't agree with that more. This American experiment we love could cease to exist or it could persevere for several generations to come, but that's really going to come down to us. So if you have a Gen Z or you care about who's interested in getting involved, please pick them up a copy of this book. It is for them. I love it. Isabel Brown, make sure you're following her on social media and as well, get a copy of the book. Isabel, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me, Chad. All right, guys, listen, I want you to head over to my website as well, watchchad.com. It's where all the fun stuff is. Catch me out on the road doing live shows and all the other stuff that we're doing. And uh, don't forget, leave us a rating and a review for the podcast. Five stars is what we deserve. And then tell me what you think. And you can drop me a line, uh, chad at the com, And uh, we'll, uh, we'll consider reading it, okay? I see some of the negative stuff you guys send in here. I don't know how you guys get everything, anything negative about what we're doing over here. For Shy, sitting over here, uh, my unseen Singaporean. God bless you, buddy. You make this thing work. I appreciate you. Uh, hey, guys, take care of yourselves. Look out for one another and uh, <laughs> keep your head on a swivel. These are crazy days we're living in. I love y'all. God bless you. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.